Howdy. <laughs> and thank you for being here this morning. It's great to see you. For those I haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm Mark Welsh. Uh, and I will try and uh, not keep you entertained, but keep you informed here this morning. But thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, you may have heard that we have a new Aggie head football coach. <laughs> what you probably have not heard is that he asked to come over this morning just so you could tie a face to a name so that if you see him around town or around campus, you can tell him hi. Tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do. This guy is an incredible football coach. He's an elite football coach, but he's an even better human being. And he is back because he wants to be a great Aggie for a long, long, long time. Coach Mike Elko. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. <laughs> Athletic Director Ross Bjork is here with Coach this morning, and he's here so he can make sure he gets him out the door quickly here in a couple of minutes because he's got to hire a staff, keep the football players here in town, recruit new ones for next year. He's a busy man these days, but Coach, it's, we're honored that you would take the time to come over. Thank you, and welcome home. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. He's also been welcomed in a wonderful way by the winningest coach in Texas A&M football history, Coach R.C. Slocum. <laughs> and I think Coach Slocum and I are both hoping he becomes the second winningest coach in A&M history <laughs> here at some point in the future. <laughs> Okay, let me, uh, let me up front and uh, set some expectations here. This is probably not gonna look or sound like a traditional State of the University address. Because I, I'm not here to announce new, um, you know, $100 million grant programs um, or things like that. It's just not the right time for that, and I'll explain that as we go through this. We're gonna get back to all that, but first we got a little bit of work to do together. And I wanna kind of talk about that today. The things, I wanna talk about where we were, and I'm not talking 10 years ago, I'm talking four months ago. And I wanna say thank you for where we've come to today. And then I wanna talk about where I think we need to go next. And then following this, this particular meeting, uh, we then start the conversation because we have to decide whether that's the right place to go. And we've got to decide what's the best way to get there. Okay, and make the adjustments necessary. But let me get into some details as we go. I do want to remind you that it was hot here in Texas last summer. <laughs> it, was, it was hot on campus last summer. Um, and uh, I'm kind of the result of the heat, unfortunately for you. Um, but it was an interesting time, and, and I don't want to go back and relive any of that, but I do want to talk about what I heard when I first got into this job, because I think it, it is important to understand as we talk about how we map out the road ahead. Uh, there were people really concerned about our reputation being damaged, and some people thought it was irreparably damaged as a university. I don't believe that's true, but it I certainly was damaged. Um, and w some people were very concerned that we weren't living up to, maybe weren't capable of living up to, or willing to live up to our core values. That's obviously a very major concern that we need to pay attention to. Uh, there were a lot of people concerned about communications issues across the university. There just didn't seem to be good information flow. They didn't really understand what was happening or why. Uh, on the academic side, there were major concerns about the role of the provost being diminished. There were concerns about academic freedom not feeling like it was valued, shared governors not feeling like it was part of the way we did business, decision making being a little too insular and, uh, and maybe uninformed. Um, a number of colleges, departments, programs have been disrupted, either torn apart, put together. A lot, of different, uh, a lot of different models were there, but people were worried that whatever the current model was, it just didn't quite feel right yet for some reason. Um, university libraries were reeling, quite frankly. Uh, they'd lost people, they'd lost status uh, in, in, I think, everybody in the faculty's mind. Uh, and they'd lost funding, which may have been the biggest long-term impact. Uh, and then there was a, a direction to call yourself a college or a school, and people felt they'd lost their identity. And in fact, they had become less competitive as a result when it came to recruiting new faculty, et cetera. 
On the administrative side, there were also some concerns. We, we had function, centralized all our functional support areas, and there was just some still uh, some uneven footing on how that was progressing in many areas of the university. Uh, the budget model had been in work for two years. There was a new hybrid budget model being developed, and we were still kind of playing around with what it looked like. People were confused about next year's model. People didn't really know how to form their own unit budgets to compete for the resources they felt they needed. Uh, and a lot of the integrating and coordinating functions uh, had, had, were missing. Things like uh, bringing our philanthropy support organizations together and talking about who was prioritizing what. Things like a strategic budget look at the university. Where do you prioritize funding? Where do you take funding, reapply funding? Where are the focus areas? Where should the emphasis be? Uh, those kind of things weren't happening, and we had the same problem in facilities. Everybody built their own new facilities project plan. They really weren't standardized. There weren't consistent funding schemes for them, and there was no real prioritization scheme across the university as to which one should come first when we had to compete for resources. On the student side, the impact of a number of years of pretty rapid growth was starting to affect them in a way that they felt. Um, and, they, and they were concerned about the student experience changing in a way that was not good for Texas A&M or for them individually, and they were pretty vocal about it, as were many of their parents, by the way. Uh, the, the, the Aggie Moms Club, uh, which the chancellor introduced me to my first week as the acting president, <laughs> was very direct on this subject and, uh, it, and actually gave some fantastic input and examples of things that were stressors now in their students' lives that they don't remember being stressors in the past. Um, so all of this was kind of going on. I would tell you my general observations were that we were divided by these concerns. It felt divided. Um, and, I, I, and it felt divided just about everywhere I went on campus. Um, but there was this underlying desire to get back on track. You could feel it. People expressed it. You could see it when they came into the conversation. They just wanted to get back to being who we know we can be and should be and really who we are every day. It just wasn't what was happening at that point in time. Okay, that seems like a long time ago to me, but it's only been four months. But let me tell you what I think has changed since then. Um, First of all, a couple of general comments. We admitted those mistakes. Everybody at the university admitted it. We acknowledged the reputational damage. We recommitted to live in those core values all day, every day, because that's what it takes to live up to them. We worked hard to reestablish communication across the university and the campus, to all areas of the campus, and I think we are still working that in some parts of the university, and we can't stop. Uh, and we worked hard to remove any barriers to communication. Those don't spring up because somebody's evilly intended. They spring up because we're, we're trying a model that just isn't working and we don't adjust very quickly. So we had a hub communications model where there are a handful of people whose responsibility was to share everything with everybody, basically. And those people are put in a very difficult situation, and when we didn't give them the resources they needed make, to make sure they had the skill sets they needed, that communication didn't go well. Um, we also had expanded the number of vice presidents at the university. These are great people who are doing great work. But um, we, I've just cut 12 of our 22 vice president titles, just removed them. The people are still doing great work. But the problem with too many vice president titles is it makes communication harder, because who do you go to? And do the right people get the word? And who is actually accountable and responsible for issues, for events, for areas of focus, those kind of things? It was just complicated. And so we've tried to streamline that, and, and that helps communication. And we've got into a routine meeting schedule now uh, that makes sense from, for the president and the cabinet level team. So I meet with a, a, an expanded executive committee, uh, executive team every week. Every other week we have a cabinet meeting with all the vice presidents and the senior directors from around the, the university. Uh, I'm doing monthly meetings now, or trying to, with, with, the, with the deans. I do a quarterly meeting with the provost, the vice provost for research, and the vice, uh, or excuse me, the vice president for research, and the vice provost for faculty affairs. We're trying to establish a battle rhythm of things so we stay connected across the university. Ross has been kind enough to let me set up a quarterly meeting with he, his senior staff, and his coaches. Um, we're trying to do the same thing with other organizations around campus. We meet quarterly with all the affiliated organizations, the foundations, the associations, and others, just to try and keep everybody connected to what's going on here at Texas A&M. 
On the academic side, the, the Vice President for Faculty Affairs Organization at the time stood up a task force on academic freedom under Dr. Heather Lynch that has done a phenomenal job of re-emphasizing and reinforcing in both system policy and university policy with their recommendations the importance, I mean the critical importance of academic freedom here at, on our campus. Uh, the quick look assessment was completed because of you. You came forward, you talked to the assessment team, you spent your time telling them what the issues were, and then you followed up with us on the solutions. And now you're in the process of implementing them. Uh, we've made the provost clearly the number two person in the university and our only executive vice president. I don't think that's, it, there's any question right now about the preeminence of the provost to the academic operations and activities of Texas A&M. I also meet monthly with faculty groups, staff groups, and student groups. The University Staff Council, Student Government Association, the different groups in Student Government Association. I try and meet monthly with the executive committees of the Faculty Senate, the University Distinguished Professors, the Council of Principal Investigators. Uh, there is also a body that's a senior faculty advisory committee to the president that was formed by President Banks that I've kept in place. I'm shifting their focus a little bit to be more of a, a, an academic think tank, if you will, that the provost and I can use to focus on emerging issues or future possibilities or things that are just confusing us or just to walk in and give us new ideas. Uh, so we've got that running as well. Uh, we've returned funding to the libraries, and as I'll tell you, give you one example in a bit, the libraries are rocking now. And then, do you want to be a college or a school? I don't care, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for one or the other, but you can decide that. Um, centralization, uh, we didn't change everything back. A lot of people thought we should. I still think centralization has some great merit, and there's some real benefits to it. If you go back and read the MGT comments for people, when people, before the MGT report was finalized, there were a lot of concerns about the people in those functional areas. They had concerns about their career progression, et cetera, et cetera, and their training, their mentoring, their path. And so and then many of those have been solved by centralization. And so rather than throw the baby out with the bathwater too quickly, what we decided to do instead is improve business services by making a couple of changes to the model and also to ensure that those functional teams inside the colleges understand that the dean of that college is leading the charge and they follow that dean's direction. Uh, we've decided on an incremental baseline budget model. Let me give you a real short version of that. It just means last year's budget is this year's budget until we change it. So we formed that Strategic Budget Council I mentioned. Every member of that council will sit with every dean, will sit with every major office uh, leader on the university, and will listen to a one-hour presentation from those folks about their budget for the coming year to include their desire to start new programs, create new accounts, uh, add new faculty or staff, whatever it might be. We'll listen to all of them, then we'll decide where the university needs to prioritize its efforts and how we allocate any additional funds we have for the next year to those efforts. And that way we look at it more than one organization at a time, which I think is important. We're at a place funding-wise now with this university. It is so large. It's a $2.65 billion business now. And it, it is a university with a specific mission related to a university, but don't forget that it's a very large business. And we've got to run it a little bit like a business on the budget side. And so everybody is competing against everybody else for every dollar. Just think of it that way. We can't add a new building here or add uh, 100 new faculty here or 100 new staff there or build a new stadium for Ross without thinking about what that does for merit pay for everybody at the university. It's all competing with, each, with itself. That's why we need a strategic budget council. That's why we have to think in terms of trades and offsets. We just have got to get better control of that in our process. And that's my job. It's my fault it's not right. And so you should expect me to fix that. Um, the strategic budget council is formed and operating the facilities committee, or council is formed and operating. Uh, we've reduced the number of capital projects we had on the current list. They, they weren't funded. Some of them weren't practical. We have to prioritize the ones we have and then try and get those others back on the list when the time comes. But uh, that's also very open. Everybody can be part of that discussion if you'd like to be. And then the Philanthropy Council is formed. We have our first meeting coming up here in the near future. And that's to bring all the associations and the foundations together. So lots of stuff has changed from this last summer. And it changed because you changed it. And I just want to say thanks. I, all that, none of that stuff, I can't do any of that stuff by myself. 
I don't have the authority. I don't have the brain. <laughs> I can't do it. But you can, and you did. So thank you for all the work you did to make that happen. Thanks for doing these things that are on this slide. Thanks for walking away from that division. Thanks for really embracing that desire to get back on track. And thanks for being part of the solution. There are a couple of hanging chads still that we kind of discovered as we went through the quick look assessment. The space allocation study most of you have heard of was, was going back and looking at the impacts of all those moves we made uh, as we executed the path forward and making sure that we, there weren't some common sense, sense things we can now do to give ourselves a little better physical posture for the next couple of years while we wait on new facilities or remodelings or those kind of things. Um, that study, by the way, I now have for review. Uh, Joe Pettibon has once again delivered in a remarkable way with a great team of people. I now have that, uh, and I'll, I'll get it reviewed by the end of this week after this presentation. <laughs> I'll worry about that one. But I've got it in hand, and I also have the recommendations from the group uh, Joe and the team who looked at the facilities organizational model and processes and how we need to change those going forward, or should we change them going forward? Do we have it right and how do we know that? So I also have that report in hand and you'll hear more about that here in the very near future. A couple of science projects still ahead of us. The big one is a capacity study that I've mentioned to you before. Uh, that'll kick off in January and go through June as will the student experience study that we're gonna do in parallel. Uh, we're going to ask all of you to be part of this. Joe's going to, in the month of December, we'll organize these two studies. We'll ask people to participate who have the right expertise, and we'll spend the next five or six months trying to figure out what has this growth done to us? Where are we really short now? And I'll talk some examples later. Um, and what do we need to do next to fix that situation? Uh, more to follow on that one. By the way, um, even back in July, when we talked about what was going on then, I mentioned a number of times to people that we can't let what was happening become who we are, because it's, it wasn't who we were. And I said that there are 10,000 great things going on on campus every single day, and they still are. The, the campus is gigantic. I mean, 77,500 students. That's absolutely incredible, actually. We still have the best faculty in the country. I, I was interested to note that it's about 50-50, tenure, tenure track and non-tenure track. I didn't realize that when I was at the Bush School. That's actually an interesting ratio. We have a world-class staff, professional, caring, completely committed. We have great donor support. We have great foundations and associations who are doing a remarkable job. Growth of the endowment, 44% in the last five years. And we have a chancellor who never quits working to increase the appropriation size for the schools in the Texas A&M University system. And I, I hope everyone understands what a gift that is. And he's really good at it. I mean, look, 30, over a third growth in the last five years in a state appropriation for our budget, that's remarkable. So lots of great things in that regard. Here's how the rest of the planet sees us. I love the Wall Street Journal ranking because it it, it weighted student outcomes, unlike U.S. News and World Report. And student outcomes are what we ought to be all about here. And so number one in Texas is, 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 a, big, is a big deal, but number six in the nation isn't bad. And climbing, I, should I mention that? <laughs> Wall Street Journal even has us in the top 20. And I think from there up in those rankings, it's now reputational. That's important. I'm going to come back to reputation. <laughs> You can kick the door down to get into the top 20. It's hard to ignore 77,500 students and a billion dollars in research expenditures. It's just hard to ignore that. But from 20 to 1 is mostly reputational. And then we still worry about cost for our students, and we need to keep worrying about cost for our students. It'll be part of that student experience survey. I'm confident that'll come up as a major component. Okay. I'm just going to, I'm not going to talk a lot about these, but you can just take a look at them. Um, incredible stuff happening in our faculty and the research side of the house. I, I will mention, just because one of my granddaughters made me watch a YouTube video with her, of Dr. Tatiana. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
So, Dr. Tatiana, I was one of the 400 million views you've gotten on YouTube. <laughs> Betty also watched you. Uh, my wife Betty, by the way, is here this morning. She's really, she maybe swore I wouldn't introduce her, but I slipped. It was an accident, so now you have to stand up and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> I may have to do the rest of this from behind the curtain. <laughs> Uh, Betty watched, also watched her on CBS Morning News and the Jennifer Hudson Show, so she's getting a lot of play. But the great part about that is that is a professor at Texas A&M, and we're, and we're like in physics, <laughs> and so does my granddaughter. That's what's coolest about it. So phenomenal work by our faculty in all these wonderful, wonderful areas. There's no kidding change in the world. On the teaching side, you can see how it, the great things that we've got going here. Hullabaloo U is becoming a huge success. I had the chance to go on the training ship Kennedy down at Galveston this year. Betty and I toured it with a couple of, uh, a couple of our young students at Galveston. One of them is going to go be a merchant marine engineer. We're standing in the engine room because he wants to be an engineer. He wants to run the engine room. And we're standing in this old ship. A, a engine room that's been around for years. It's spaghetti and pipes, and I mean, it's a, it's a mess. And he's standing in the middle of it explaining what the manifolds were to us. And I'm really trying hard to follow him and failing. And all of a sudden, he just stops talking. And he literally, <laughs> Betty will confirm this for you, he just threw his hands up and he screamed, I'm sorry, I just love this place. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool. Uh, I'll be in New York next week for the keel laying of the new, the new vessel, the new Lone Star State that'll show up in Galveston down at 25, which I'm really excited about. That last one on here about the libraries, I mentioned earlier the libraries are rocking. You know, book costs, um, course uh, accounting has been a focus area for the provost for a while now and for the libraries. Uh, they are this year going to be able to reduce the uh, cost of 19 our books in 19 different courses to the extent that we're going to save a million dollars in student uh, book fees this year, which is incredible. Our students are also incredible. A third of them participate and, and contribute almost three quarters of a million hours of public service in the Brazos Valley every year. Those are incredible numbers. Law school continues to rocket its way up the charts. I saw Dean Bobby, Bobby Adia here somewhere. Where are you, Bobby? So I'm sneak in. He's here. Oh, there he is, uh, lurking in the middle aisle. <laughs> They're doing a great job. By the way, that number one bar pass rate in Texas is the highest bar pass rate in Texas in the last 10 years. Phenomenal accomplishment. Um, and you can, the Corps of Cadets marched into 3,000, the first in-med class graduated, the first physicianers join our health services across the country. Really an incredible accomplishment by Rod Pettigrew and his team. Um, and then our grad, graduation rates for first-gen students is a huge deal for Texas A&M and for our state and nation. And we have 21% of our student body now is first-gen, which is also a great thing. On the staff side, everybody's doing great work. Everybody. That Marcom number on there, 2.3 million followers on social media. That's the highest in the Southeastern Conference. It's the highest in Texas, and it's the highest in the country. Nobody else close to that number. <laughs> well, congratulations and thank you to our Marcom team. On the athletic side, Ross's folks do a lot of the same stuff the rest of the student body does. They just don't get the same visibility. We only have 600 intercollegiate athletes here at Texas A&M. Well over half of them do service work in the Brazos Valley, and they do it routinely. Um, you can see the graduation rate there. That's a phenomenal statistic as well. Low amateur at the, the Masters, Sam Bennett repping Texas A&M, um, and then a sustainability master plan for our athletics facilities, which is a phenomenal step forward. So lots of great stuff happening on the athletic side of the house. Across the campus, um, everything happens here that's good. I was got a chance with Betty to uh, be at Betty, the Becky Gates Center's 25th anniversary. What a great lady she is and what a great legacy she leaves in that child care center. And if you missed the Troubadour Festival at Aggie Park last May, I missed it. <laughs> Everybody who went says it was just incredible. Woo! Music, brisket, life was good. <laughs> They're coming back in May of 24, so I'll see you there. 
And then, of course, the law school, new building going up in Fort Worth as part of the new education complex and research complex there in, in the middle of downtown Fort Worth, which is a fantastic thing. Okay, so that's how we're doing. That's a pretty good place to be standing, in my view. You're, you guys are awesome. You, you, you don't know how awesome you are. You're awesome. And this place is incredible. But we're not where we need to be yet, in Mark's opinion. And I'll, I'll talk to you about why. But the most important thing about this slide and that road, the only real requirement to be successful is that we walk down this road together. We have a map already. For, for those of you who've forgotten, we do have a vision for 2020 to 2030. It's called the Decade of Excellence. There's a picture of the cover on the right. And these are the four pillars that are in that vision. It's a pretty darn good document. We also have a strategic plan for 2020 to 2025, and it's also a pretty darn good document. It's got six priorities. They're on the chart here. You can read them. The only reason I put those things up here is because everything I'm going to say from here forward falls within that construct. And I think it should. Let me tell you a little bit about my first four months as the interim president. Uh, the, the first thing I'll tell you is that it has been an unbelievable privilege to represent this university in any way at any time. It just is kind of uplifting. The best part about the job is I get to meet people and visit organizations that I would not have met and would not have visited if I'd stayed as the dean of the Bush School. I love the Bush School, by the way. It's a lot calmer over there. <laughs> I've noticed. <laughs> but I love that place. But I would not have met all of you. I wouldn't have had a chance to talk with you. I wouldn't have had a chance to visit your labs. I wouldn't have had a chance to meet Ross's coaches. I wouldn't have had a chance to do any of those things. And all those things make Aggieland special. Uh, I've had a chance to visit with faculty members who are so inspired by their students that all they can talk about is the accomplishments of their students. And I'm talking to a, a university's distinguished professor or an eminent researcher who has done unbelievable things to change the course of technology or the humanities or thinking about philosophy or national security. And all they're excited about is their students' research paper. I've met staff members who can't wait to get to work in the morning after leaving the event in Aggie Park last night at 9.30 and going to the hospital to sit with a family of a student who is badly injured because somebody has to be there with them, don't they? And they are in some pretty horrible circumstances. And they help families and Aggies through those things. And then they go to work the next morning at the regular time because they got stuff they're excited about getting done. And I met students who are, they can't even believe how much they enjoy being a student at Texas A&M. And they can't believe that they came from a place like Nigeria or L.A. or <laughs> <laughs> New York City. Uh, and they come here and they are more aggy than anybody you meet on campus. Because people have accepted them, people listen to them, people have become family to them. It is just a remarkable place to be. Betty and I went, I'm gonna get a little emotional, forgive me. Betty and I went to a silver tap ceremony here recently. I'm gonna come back to the idea of traditions later, but we went to a silver tap ceremony last month, or earlier this month. There were three students being honored, only one of the families was able to come because the others lived pretty far away. Um, but we had a chance to hang out with the Traditions Council students who manage the event and help, um, help the family get through it, and the staff who support that Traditions Council. Uh, we had a chance to see the entire thing from a different perspective. I'd been to many Silver Taps before, but I've never stood behind the family. And when you stand right behind the family at a Silver Taps, it is a different experience. I think most of you have been to one. If you haven't, in a little bit, I'm going to encourage you to go. But when you stand behind the family, everything is dark, but you see shadow. And you can see how many people are actually attending that ceremony. I don't know how many were there that night. 10,000? 5,000? 8,000? A lot. 
But you can see down the sidewalks as far as you can see, and there's students walking in to, and just kind of joining the crowd. And I got distracted by that because I was astonished at how many were coming out into the dark and joining the ceremony. I'd, never, I'd always been in the crowd. I didn't really look at the crowd. And then all of a sudden, the Ross volunteers and their all whites were right there. I didn't even hear them approaching. And then they went into the slow ceremonial kind of slide step to position in front of the family. And when you're the family looking at that, they're close. And it, it's like the world goes into slow motion. And your emotions are just building as they're doing this. I know how I felt. I can't imagine how they felt. And when they fire the 21 gun salute, it's right in front of them. It's really loud. And it just kind of soaks into you. And after they leave, and the silence is just kind of hanging there in the dark, the lights come on, and students start filtering away. Not all of them. They just start filtering away in the crowd. And you can see how many there actually were. And the family can see which way they're, they're going into all points of the compass. And when the family can't sit there any longer because they don't know what to do next, they stand up and the students are waiting to greet them if they want to be greeted. And the students just embrace them. It is an incredible experience. It gives you a completely different view of Texas A&M. I love this place. But I'm not the only one. What do I love about Texas A&M? Uh, this may sound like a cop-out answer, but uh, I love the students. And I tell people all the time, I, I teach for free, but I get paid to grade. Uh, once you get to Texas A&M, again, the students, I've found them to be um, just solid citizens. Um, students who come here are raised well. They have a strong work ethic. Students who come here are top-notch academically, but even more so, I think it's the, it's the way that they it's the way that they see life, the way that they approach life. It's special because this school creates leaders and leaders that I would want to see in the world and that I want to know. And so that's really special to me that really sets us apart from every other university. Well, as a first generation immigrant from Monterrey, Mexico, pursuing an education has always been very important to me. A lot of thought went into the decision to attend Texas A&M but ultimately, this university has provided me with so many resources to not only succeed academically, but also to achieve personal and professional growth. The, the boundaries are limitless. So that, for me, that's what I love about Texas A&M is no matter where you come from, who you are, if you want to succeed and you want to work hard, Texas A&M will support you to do that. I just enjoy walking across campus and uh, it could be miles across from you know maybe a building to building but uh, in that you always you typically see somebody that you know uh, so I love when A&M as big and complex as it is when it can feel small. Uh, I think A&M traditions make university right, really special and unique right I mean we were talking about uh, uh, you know Yale practice or having a bigger event I get I mean those traditions really bring the community and old Aggie family together. But it really just means being able to be a part of something outside of myself and knowing that there is a tradition of excellence behind me, but also that I'm expected to contribute to this excellence going forward. I love the football games. I love the environment. I love how active everyone in this community is. I love how kind people are. Numerous people just help you whenever you ask for them. This idea that someone can come here and just be completely transformed by their time and their experiences here. I mean, I'm evidence of that. This place has changed my life and it's changed my family's life. Yeah, my thanks to all of those folks. I think there's eight things we need to do going forward. Um, I'm gonna talk about them in terms of near horizon and far horizon because the first three set up everything else. And I think it's important to get them done first before you step into the other things because they inform all of those things. Um, but let me, and I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you, show you all eight of them, then I'll come back and talk about each of them briefly. By the foundation, I mean the infrastructure, the university, the buildings, the classrooms, the lab space, the number of faculty members, the number of staff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'll talk a bit more in detail about that in a minute. But we've got to get this university right-sized, if you will, for 80,000 students. 
because it's not there right now. Uh, we need to define our research identity. Not that we don't do great research, we do, but how do we want to define it? How do we want to incentivize our research going forward to match that definition? Um, how do we market it, et cetera? Um, we got to build our academic roadmap, and I'll talk a minute about education changing and do we need to change with it or not? It's the decision that our faculty needs to make in a discussion led by our provost. On the far horizon, I think once we've got those three things straight and we know where we want to fully engage and invest, then we need to make Texas A&M a constant in the national conversation. We need to create the nation's number one student experience here. There is no reason we can't. Now, we need to graduate great citizens, not just great Aggies. Uh, and we need to become the nation's number one veteran-serving university, not because of my history, but because of the university's history. <laughs> And we need to hug our affiliated foundations and associations and get them really involved in everything we do so there's no risk of them not being connected to the priorities that we set. Okay, before I talk about fixing the technical stuff in the foundation, let me talk a little bit about the cultural piece of any change that has to happen because it's, it's gotta be part of things. Now we have a great culture here in my view, and I'm not talking about fixing something that's broken, I'm just talking about making it stronger. The great thing about Texas A&M is if you walk around the campus, it's hard when you get busy and you're, I'm, I'm walking around now just trying to learn building names, so I'm distracted just by the signs. But if you walk around and actually just take a look every now and then, it's incredible what's on this campus. There is iconic architecture. There, there are incredible facilities. Uh, there's just all kinds of things that get your attention when you give them time to catch your attention. It's a place of inspiration. All the monuments, the memorials that are around campus, if you stop and pay attention to them and you learn the story behind them, it's also a place of legacy. Legacy matters here, and our campus reflects it. And then when you think about the traditions of A&M, those traditions endure, which is a remarkable thing for us. But all of these things are part of that spirit of Aggie land that people talk about, you know, as if it's some mystical thing, because quite frankly, it is kind of a mystical thing. And I think we all need to re-embrace it, all of us. It doesn't take much. I'm not gonna ask you to answer this question out loud, but just ask yourself, have I ever been to a you know, a silver taps, have I been to muster? Have I been to a, you know, a ring ceremony? Have I been to a, you pick one of the multiple traditions, bonfire remembrance. I don't know how many people were there either on November 18th at 2.42 a.m., but there were a lot. And there were probably 50 to 60 family members 24 years after the fact who are still coming back to that ceremony <laughs> to celebrate with Aggies because here they feel home. It's a remarkable place. And I'm, I'm gonna invite deans to come with me to all these things, and vice presidents. I would encourage you to invite your new assistant professor to join you for a Silver Taps sometime this year. You know, invite your new lecturer to go with you. Take a department trip to Kyle Field. Let Ross give you a tour. He can, one of his team will be happy to do that and talk to you about the stadium. <laughs> You can catch him up on, you know, on whatever subject you teach because he was, he was not way up on some of that when he was playing football in college. <laughs> <laughs> Let's help ourselves re-embrace the spirit of this great place. I think it makes everything better and it gives you a completely different perspective on Texas A&M. Ask a student to take you to one of these things. Get a campus tour with one of your students. Let them take you on a tour and take a group of, of your faculty members or your staff members and let the students talk to you about what they admire about the campus, where they hang out, what they do, where they spend their free time. All things that are really interesting and meaningful and connect us better. It's all about family here. And from the first second anyone sets foot on this campus, I don't care if they're faculty, staff, or students, I don't care where they come from. I don't care what they did before. I don't care what they look like, what they sound like. I don't care. The first time they set foot on this campus, they're family. And they should be treated that way. And we should have their back forever. Let's keep building that. Because that matters more than anything else we do in, in the big scheme of things. 
Okay, fixed foundation. We know that we don't have enough faculty for the number of students we have right now. We know we don't have enough staff for the support we should be providing to students that we have right now. It's not because anybody did anything wrong, it's because growth has been incentivized and growth has been spectacular. And we're serving the state of Texas very, very well. But it's time for us to take a deep breath and make sure we understand the impact that growth has had and that we decide where we need to spend the next dollar to continue doing this the right way into the future. That's why this is not a here's more grant money kind of state of the university. We gotta get our arms around this, we just have to, and make sure that we have the right plan going forward. We need to do market analysis on our salaries across the campus and make sure we are competitive. For so many decades, Texas A&M set the market standard in, this, in the Brazos Valley for jobs. You, you probably noticed College Station and Bryan are growing. <laughs> We don't set the market standard anymore in every career field. And we have to stay competitive or we're gonna lose great people from our university to better job opportunities in the community. And if we can prevent that, we should. We need to look at where our infrastructure investments should go first. We have almost a billion dollars in um, deferred maintenance costs across our university. That's a lot of money and it's hard to eat your way out of that hole. How should we manage that going forward? Um, should we buy new or should we repair old? These are fundamental questions that large organizations have to face, and we have to face them head on. Um, we have to have a realistic executable capital plan. It can't all rely on enrollment growth or donor money. That doesn't work over time. Uh, it'll be part of the plan, but it can't be the plan. And then we have to make sure we have a target student number in mind as we grow. Now, we may not be able to always control it exactly, and that's okay. We'd like to serve as much of Texas as we can. But we need to grow it as much as we can in a balanced way so that student experience doesn't change. If the student experience starts to be more frustration than great memories, A&M and Texas lose over time. So we can't let it get to that point. And by the way, I believe that this stuff is a must-pay bill. And we've got to figure out how much that bill is before we spend money on other things. I mentioned research identity before. It, it's what are we known for as an institution? We do, we do research across the board in everything, which is phenomenal. I'm not talking about changing that. I'm just talking about how do we, how do we identify our current research? How do we talk about it? Can we bundle it into, in, under umbrellas that we can then market? You know, if you want to do anything in the space arena in terms of research, or you have questions that you need answered in terms of uh, space hypersonics, space propulsion, space manufacturing, space architecture, space agriculture, space medicine, you pick it. Materials engineering, we're doing all that here. If you want to talk about how space is going to affect the humanities in the future, how visualization is going to be used in space, any of those topics, philosophy and how it affects space policy, it's an interesting idea. How do we capture all this in whatever the category is, space, energy, a topic in the humanities or the social sciences, you pick it. How do we capture it, bundle it, and then how do we market it? We've got a brand new director of marketing and communication showing up now. He'll join the great team that's already in place. Um, and, and I meet with him Friday for the first time. And I'm gonna tell him to figure out how do we market research better to benefit Texas A&M and its researchers in the future. I think we also have to think about the fact that education is changing. You, you, most of you, in the, the, all of you on the faculty know this better than I do, but it is changing and so are our customers. Um, ed, extended education is in demand more and more and more for everything from certificates to continuation edu, continuing education to degree programs of, at all levels. Uh, Re-education, if, if we're in a workforce where 90% of the jobs can be obsolete by 2050, how do you re-educate that workforce in the future? And what's required to do that? Is it, is it a traditional degree program or is it some other construct? Uh, burst learning is become a, becoming a big deal for people moving into new jobs or new career fields and they want a certificate or an expanded certificate that gives them a learning in a particular area that they are not as comfortable in. They're energetic, they're ambitious, and they want to keep moving forward and they're looking for that education. Uh, tech companies are refreshing and want to refresh their technology base of knowledge of their workforce every five years now because of the pace of change of their technology. 
that's another opportunity. It's another demand signal. And of course, even our own students here on campus are talking about, well, we want more competencies than degrees. How do we focus that? How do we build those into our current programs? Most of, of, of those programs already have that construct. But do we shift to a different kind of degree program in the future focused on competencies versus degrees? I, I, I don't know. I'm not the person to figure that out. Our faculty is. But this is the kind of discussion that our provost needs to lead with the deans and our faculty and decide where do we need to adjust or do we not need to adjust. But let's make that decision before we decide where to invest so that we invest in the right places. In the next 10 years, I hope to see Texas A&M being pioneers to the solutions of the future, whether that's healthcare or space exploration. I know that Texas A&M can do it, and I'm really excited to be a part of that process. I talk to a lot of students, and uh, I really believe that we need to focus for the next number of years on bringing our student resources up to the level where our student population is. Accessibility and universal design through our new developments and even our current developments of every student being able to utilize an elevator or um, resources being given out to all students, not just your atypical student. Or, uh, I think there's opportunity for us to use our resources and be a trailblazer for accessibility and universal design. I hope A&M continues to grow. And I don't really necessarily think of that in terms of students and, and buildings, brick and mortar and those kind of things, although I'm sure that's part of it, at least to some extent. But I hope A&M continues to grow in terms of impact, in terms of influence, and again, it may sound cheesy or corny, but in terms of changing the world. And I would just hope that we keep our core values um, in the forefront of our minds as the growth continues, because with growth, then um, a lot of things will be changing, and I want to make sure that we keep what got us to where we're at. But I also want to be able to as we are shaping and molding, as we're growing, that we still continue to stay true to who we are. I think that having those values as a constant reminder of what it means to be an Aggie is so amazing, such a great, fulfilling feeling. I actually carry them on my wrist all the time. I really hope that you know some of the students really just dive into some of the traditions more. The silver taps and you know mustard and some of those things are. I think we could really just do a lot better to you know bring the student body together because I, I've been to a lot of the silver taps and they've been big, but we've got a lot of people here on campus and I think we could make it even bigger. I think that's one place that really makes this place unique is our ability to say that we really honor tradition, but in that we have to be able to, you know, look at the world around us and be able to change and adapt and I hope that Aggies in the future are able to have that ability to change, adapt and kind of overcome those challenges of the future. One of my favorite phrases always told me as a kid, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But Aggies, we don't follow that. If it's fixed, we make it better. I hope that, you know, no matter how big or how large or how much reach A&M might have, that, you know, we still are able to hold on to that sense of family and community because that truly is what makes this school stand apart from any other school in the entire world. Um, and if we can hold on to that and what it means to be part of the Aggie family, we'll have it set for another century. <laughs>
you know, the ag school, engineering, vet med, uh, some of the research we've done in the humanities and social sciences has gotten a ton of attention nationally. My, what I'm talking about is staying in that conversation, being in it all the time. Uh, so the a and is always being discussed in some way. Maybe it's nuclear engineering, maybe it's energy, maybe it's the, the space research that we do, maybe it's uh, the new visualization programs, maybe it's whatever. It's something. And each of those different circles on that chart give us an opportunity to do that. And I think we can do that in a major way. It involves putting it all together, playing to our strengths. We are a very large, dynamic, and kind of fearless organization. We can do things others are afraid to try. We can take a chance. Um, we need to invest in the areas we think that elevate the reputation of our university the most. And we need to blend and market all those things in a way that keeps A&M in everyone's conversation. Because I think we are a great institution, but a great national institution requires a great national reputation. This is the key to moving up from number 20. There is absolutely no reason we should not have the nation's number one student experience here. All the ingredients are in place. And I think it's a fairly straightforward formula. I think it's listen to our students, benchmark our peers who are the best at this, invest in a structured way over time, partner with our student government association and make them part of the plan and part of the execution. And we'll, once we get that right, let's just rinse and repeat and constantly assess where we stand. I really believe we need to think about how we graduate great citizens, not just great Aggies. I think we do that, I just don't think we talk about it much. And the reason I think it's important is because we need great citizens right now. Our state needs them, our nation needs them, our world needs them. And there's lots of things we can do here, in fact, many things we are already doing here to make this a reality, we just don't connect them in any way that allows us to highlight it and advertise it. If you think of all the student service organizations, if you think of the core, if you think of the different leadership training programs we have, all those things are pluses, but they're all eaches. They're not connected in any way. Can you create a uh, citizenship and service academy that bridges across all the colleges that, where students can actually get academic credit for a course in uh, civics, which is hard to find these days? Um, or something that teaches our students the rights and responsibilities of citizenship before they graduate. Or something that educates them on how to run for public office should they so choose in the future. What's a PAC? What's the best way to run for public office? Is it better to start small or go big? There's lots of questions. We have lots of great Aggies who would come back and help us do this who were public servants, who were elected officials. And I think would be excited about helping us put something like this together. Anyway, the other part of it is how are we already all contributing to this? How do we capture that and tell that story in a meaningful way? There are a lot of people around this country looking to send their children to some place that will make them a better citizen. A lot. I didn't know that until I came here. We get lots of calls about that here. I mentioned being the number one veteran serving organization. Um, and this may not just be a and in College Station, this may be a system goal, because a and system gives us a lot of opportunities. Job market's much bigger in San Antonio, for example. Uh, a lot of veterans like retiring in San Antonio because it's a very military-friendly city. Can we work education here, internships there, job opportunities there? Can we tailor degree or certificate programs, and which ones, because you can't do that with everything? Veterans are looking for more flexible content delivery. The average veteran is not a 22-year-old single person. The average vet is a 32 or 33-year-old mid-level non-commissioned officer who retires with a wife or her husband and a couple of kids. They need jobs, their, their spouses need jobs, their kids need schools. They, it, it, we've got to think about all that as we do this, and we need to think about working at a higher level inside the Department of Defense. The work that Jerry Smith and the Veteran Support Center here has done is absolutely spectacular. And they put us in a position to take the next step. And I think we should. And finally, I mentioned hugging our best friends, but these are the partners who ensure the future of Texas A&M University. 
Some of them focus, you know, the core association focuses on developing the core over time. George and Barbara Bush Foundation supports the Bush School. 12th Man supports Aggie Athletics in all its forms. The uh, Association of Former Students supports our graduate community and supports activities, scholarships, students here on main campus. And then the A&M Foundation is kind of the big engine that supports anything that benefits people at Texas A&M. It's all about serving Aggies and creating better programs, better scholarship offerings, um, better dynamics for our students as they go through the program that set them up for success. So that we have an unbelievable team that helps us in our work here. Uh, they need to be routinely and, and officially engaged in our process. That's what that philanthropy strategy council is all about, bringing them together so we're all talking about the future together. They need to be, have visibility uh, in, across our university. They need to be in the conversation. Their voices really matter, and their expertise is something we need to lean on because we don't know a lot about fundraising. When you get right down to the nuts and bolts of it, these folks do. They're really good at it, and we need to get them helping us get where we want to go. So we need them close. Okay, here's the what I would call the roadmap or the timeline for the things I just talked about. Those two studies, the capacity study and the student uh, experience study start in January and go through June of 24. At the same time, I think uh, the provost, we, I'm going to test the provost to start this, uh, this study of research identity, or uh, not the provost, but the provost and Jack Baldoff to start the research identity study and also start talking about through the academic roadmap. Where are we going? Now, they need to, may need to adjust that timeline a little bit because we are still a little bit in rehab from last summer and some of the changes, and they're adjusting to those changes now. So if the provost comes back and says he needs another couple of months, okay, we can do that. But we gotta get to this. We gotta figure it out because everything else will happen after that. As soon as those reports are done, we're gonna start figuring out allocations of funding and resource prioritization to fix the foundation. And we'll talk a lot more about that before we get to decision time, and you guys have to be part of that conversation. Um, and at the same time, I think we start organizing for the step beyond fixing the foundation, which includes all those other five things I mentioned for the far horizon, which I think should be part of the discussion around Vision 2040. It's time to think about that. Vision 2020 was wonderful for Texas A&M. It gave a great structure within which we could operate and move in positive directions. It's time for Vision 2040. And we'll get organized for that here over the next six months so we can kick it off sometime um, no later than the beginning of the next academic year. Here are the offices who will be accountable for these things. Good old Joe Pettibon, our Vice President for Planning, Assessment, and Strategy. <laughs> I, for a second, I thought that was Joe running for the door. <laughs> I wouldn't blame him, actually. Um, and then as you can see, those five things in the bottom are those far horizon items. And we'll, we'll start those, we'll, we'll task those out as we get started in Vision 2040 and, and, and get be, so they're moving before all that effort gets going. Okay, I love that picture on the left. Actually, I love the picture on the right. That picture on the left is from the 1923 yearbook. The coolest thing about that picture to me is I know after four months in this job that when future Aggies walk through what are now those virtual gates, you're going to be waiting for them. And you will mentor them, you'll guide them, you'll teach them, you'll give them life lessons, and you'll be role models for them. And you'll inspire them the same way they inspire you. I think it's really important for all of us to understand that all the stuff I just mentioned, I can't plan or execute that stuff by myself at all. But we can. Is Michael O'Quinn here? Where's the Michael? Oh, there he is. For those of you who won't know Michael, you might not know that he only speaks in an Irish brogue on Wednesdays now. <laughs> He's told me he's always done this, but I think he just started it because he loves to say, Mark A. Welsh, the turd. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me it's not true. <laughs> 
But here's something else he said to me this morning. He said, it, it's not what's said today that matters. It's what's done tomorrow. I'm ready to get to work. And I hope you'll join me. Thank you for being here today at Gigham.